Hi, my name is Robert Singer. I'm a professor at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and uh, a senior fellow at the Genelia Research Campus of the HHMI. And I'm going to talk to you in this lecture specifically of methods that we developed to image both translation and degradation of mRNAs in living cells. So, in the last talk, I focused on this cell, the neuron, where RNAs have to get to these little spines and localize there in response to a stimulation. And I have not shown you that the RNAs translate when they get there. And so, in order to do that, we had to develop methodology to look at RNAs translating. And I'm going to talk to you about a few of those uh, techniques that we've developed that allow us to see various aspects of mRNA translation and where it occurs in the cell. Now, remember, I mentioned that there are... that this is a general principle of localized translation, that the RNA has to come out to the... out of the nucleus. It has to be translationally repressed when it comes out, if it's going to localize, because it wouldn't make any sense to make proteins uh, before it localized, because the proteins would be in the wrong place. So, it has to wait till it gets to the very end of the line and... Uh, and then get activated to translate. And at that point, uh, enzymes are waiting for it at the... associated with the membrane. And uh, they phosphorylate the proteins that are repressing the RNA from being translated. And those uh, proteins could be ZBP1 in the case of mammalian cells and neurons, and these two proteins, PUF6 and KHD1, in the case of the ASH1 message for, um, for yeast that goes to the bud tip. So, this uh, is the model that we're working from um, that I've showed you before, uh, that uh, you have a synaptic... Uh, transmission that occurs. Uh, so, when a uh, presynaptic uh, neuron meets a postsynaptic neuron at the dendritic spine and then sends impulses there, those impulses are translated into a signal which causes this RNA granule to disassociate releasing RNA for some local translation. And it's repetitive translation here that is necessary for the learning and memory paradigm, that every time a new stimulation comes in, then uh, new proteins are made. And those proteins accumulate in the synapse, in this case, uh, actin, and structurally stabilizes the synapse so it can be more permanent and hence a permanent memory. So, let's talk about imaging translation. Uh, so, one of the ways that we can image translation is to label the ribosome in one color and then label the RNA in another color. And so, when the two of them come together, we know that the ribosome is on the RNA and the uh, translation is occurring. So, how do we assay that? Well, one way to assay that is with a process called fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. So, here's how it works. A two-photon microscope can generate a fluorescent uh, spot in uh, a very small size. And, in fact, the size here is a femtoliter, and it's drawn to scale in the cell. And uh, that spot is a spot of excitation, uh, where the excitation light has... has um, coalesced to... Uh, to this small location, and any molecules that are caught in that spot then fluoresce. And so, uh, if a molecule now diffuses through this spot, shown here, blown up, um, they will send off a spike of photons at that moment that it diffuses through. And if the spike of photons is red uh, or green, 
that tells you you're looking at the protein, the ribosome, or the RNA. But if the spikes occur simultaneously, say within a few uh, microseconds, uh, as the molecules diffuse through the spot, then, um, then you know that the molecules have to be together because the signals are simultaneously uh, in their excitation. So, from this kind of data, we could position the spot anywhere we want in the cell and ask, are, is RNA being translated over here? Uh, is RNA being translated over here? Now, as I showed you before, the model was that the RNA is translationally repressed for beta actin when it comes out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And uh, when it comes over here to the leading edge, then it gets uh, translated. So, uh, we can look at that uh, and catalog the number of spikes we see with this spot, and we can see that in the perinuclear region, there are very few ribosomes here on the RNA. But when it gets to the periphery of the cell, there's three times as many ribosomes on the RNA as there is in the, um, in the perinuclear region. And as I showed you, one of the proteins that represses RNA translation is uh, ZBP1. So, if we look at this in a ZBP1 knockout, you see there's no difference between the perinuclear region and the peripheral region. The gradient is destroyed because the RNA now can translate anywhere in the cell. It can be occupied by ribosomes, whether it's in the perinuclear or the peripheral region, and not hold off uh, until it gets to the right place, because its translation is not repressed. So, that's one way to look at uh, translation, uh, looking at how the RNA is, is uh, regulated in different parts of the cell. And this kind of summarizes the results from that ribosomes loaded up in the periphery region, making actin, or in the uh, areas near synaptic spines and neurons, uh, but not in the, per in, the, uh, in the perinuclear region. Okay, but now um, we would like to see translation of single RNAs, and um, how do we do that? So, as I mentioned to you before, we have these stem loop systems, uh, one MS2 and the other PP7. And they um, are orthogonal to each other. So the uh, MS2 here uh, stem loop does not see PP7 and vice versa. So we have two colors. So how do we use these two colors? Well, we can use one color to put it in the coding region. And that means that the, uh, the, the stem loops had to be designed so that they coded uh, in an open reading frame uh, so they could be translated. And then in the 3' UTR, where there are no ribosomes will exist, um, we put a different stem loop, the MS2, that's red here, with a red coat protein. Now, what happens is when the ribosome comes through, the, uh, the coding region here, uh, it makes protein and it melts these stem loops, and the, therefore the coat protein gets knocked off. And the knocked off coat protein then uh, shows that the uh, RNA switches from an orange color, which is red plus green, to just a red color. And you can see that happen in real time. Here's just uh, an image from a movie that was taken. First thing you can see is all the RNAs in the nucleus are yellow because they're not being translated, so they have both proteins on them. But as soon as they're out in the cytoplasm, you see red RNAs. And you don't know how long these RNAs have been since they've been translated because this is a pioneer or first round reporter. That is, once the RNA is translated, it's always going to be red because the green capsid protein has now gone back into the nucleus because it had a nuclear localization signal. But you do see some yellow RNAs. Here's one right here. These arrows are pointing to them. Um, and the yellow RNAs here 
there's one down here, that, uh, that haven't been translated yet. And so those must be newly exported RNAs because ribosomes have not gotten on them. And you can calculate how long it takes, and it takes 10 minutes or so for an, uh, an average RNA to get translated and get the capsid protein knocked off so it turns from yellow to red. And that's kind of a surprising number. You, you'd expect that the RNA would get translated immediately, but it doesn't. It, uh, it hangs around for a little while until ribosomes uh, activate the uh, translation and knock the protein off. Here's a, an application, a biological application for this. The Drosophila embryo does not translate its RNA, Oscar, until it's actually uh, at the posterior pole of the embryo. And you can see in earlier embryos, so this is an ovary where we're looking at many developmental stages at once, but here's a uh, oocyte here, and you can see the RNA here is tagged yellow, uh, and here it's red, here at the posterior pole. And so this indicates that the regulation for this mRNA, which is for factors which are important in germline development at the posterior uh, Drosophila embryo, are not activated until they get to the posterior, presumably because they would wreak havoc if they were translated any time too soon. They would wreak havoc with the polarity of the embryo. So this is an example of how this technology is used to actually identify the site of where translation occurs here in the, in the embryo. Okay, but these are examples of the first uh, round of translation. What about watching RNA over the long period of time being translated again and again and again? Is there a mechanism to do that? And the development that was done uh, for that uses this technique, this uh, protein that was uh, developed in uh, Ron Vale's lab that uh, is a single-chain antibody that can see an epitope. And it can be... the single-chain antibody can be genetically expressed in the same cell that the epitope was expressed, so it will bind the epitopes. And what we did is we put, like we did with the uh, MS2 RNA, we put a lot of these epitopes on the front end of the protein, so when the protein first is translated, the uh, antibodies bind, and the nascent chain of the protein becomes very bright, and the RNA is labeled with a stem loops. So where the stem loop signal and the nascent chain signal coincide on a single molecule, that is a molecule that at that moment is being translated. And so uh, this is the construct. The, the epitopes are called sun tags. And in addition on this construct is a, a degron, an oxygen-induced degron, where the protein, once it's finished being made, it degrades. So it doesn't form a lot of signal in the background when you're looking at RNA being translated. So let's take a look and see what you see when you use this. And one of the first things you see is that you can actually measure the velocity of ribosomes on the RNA. And here's how you do it. Here's the... Uh, up here is this point source, which is being bleached um, so that all the fluorescent tags on it are now dark. And so any increase in signal is due to the fact that you're adding new epitopes uh, on... By, as a result of the synthesis of the protein. And this is the recovery uh, in, in minutes from after being bleached for that single RNA. Now we're looking at one molecule recovering its synthesis. So we can observe the translation of the... of RNAs with increasing uh, open reading frame lengths and their recovery from photobleaching. And it turns out that although longer open reading frames take a longer time to get to saturation, the slope 
of their increase is always the same. It's always one parameter. And the slope tells you how many amino acids per second uh, are being added to each individual RNA. And they all show uh, approximately five amino acids per second in terms of velocity. And this happens to, to agree with the work done by John Weissman and Nick Angolia, which uh, used a bulk analysis, ribosome footprinting, to measure protein synthesis rates and got the same number. So the individual RNAs do recapitulate what has been shown by bulk analysis. But one of the interesting aspects here is you can look at the neuron example, which I brought up before. And this is a fixed neuron. So the reds here are mRNAs that are in the neuron and uh, detected by the MS2. And the yellows are proteins. I mean, the greens are proteins that are detected by the SunTag antibodies, tag with GFP. But these yellow arrows here, which are in various parts, are, are pointing to yellow spots which are... which represent RNAs which are in the act of being translating... Uh, being translated. And so, in this case, uh, you can see that almost uh, all the RNAs in the neuron are not being translated at this given moment when the neuron was fixed, uh, and only a small percentage are being translated at any one time. This is consistent with what we observed, that the RNAs get activated at particular sites that uh, receive synaptic stimulation. And then this culture, there are all sorts of synapses that occur uh, while the cells are maturing. So one can look in live neurons and see translation. One of the surprises is that that you could see that uh, in neurons, RNAs actually move around while they're being translated. And that's not consistent with what our hypothesis was. And we can only suggest that RNAs can uh, perhaps initiate uh, translation at a synapse, but then maybe move on and, uh, and cruise around while dragging their nascent chains with them. We don't know for sure whether that's the case. But one of the interesting observations here is, like transcription, translation bursts. And here's an example of two RNAs, one red RNA, one green RNA, uh, that are colored, uh, pseudocolored, just for you to distinguish them. But um, you can see the red RNA gives a burst of translation and then shuts down. And then a green RNA gives a burst of translation and shuts down. The red RNA comes back after a quiet period of several uh, tens of minutes. So, so the process of translation is bursty the way the process of transcription is. And that's because, stochastically, the problem is a ribosome finding an RNA or a polymerase finding a DNA is essentially the same logistical problem. They have to diffuse and then bind. And you don't know when that diffusion and binding is going to occur. But when they do bind and they assemble initiation factors for translation here, um, several ribosomes can get on in a relatively short period, and then they all fall off, uh, waiting for the next round of initiation. So here's an analysis of the dynamics uh, of many RNAs, showing another uh, RNA here, which is bursting in its translation. Um, and we can see that the translation bursts are usually in the order of 30 minutes. So for a average burst, each mRNA makes 20 or 30 proteins. And that 30 minutes happens to agree with what we saw with a granule disintegration that I told you in the previous lecture, that the granules uh, disintegrate and they uh, make the RNA available because the uh, 
the stimulation causes this process to occur. And the burst is probably caused by a granule dissociating and then uh, RNA being translated and then going back to its quiescent state. And uh, the fact that it makes 30 proteins or so means that in order to change the structure of the synapse so it's a permanent synaptic structure, there would have to be 30 to 100 bursts to make enough actin molecules to actually change that synaptic structure. And that is that repetition is what we think leads to what's known as potentiation or, uh, in other uh, words, the fixation of a memory uh, contact. Now, what about the RNA degrading? Well, we had now these RNAs have to degrade at some point, but where they have to really be sure that they get out of the way is during the cell cycle. Because RNAs which are made during the cell cycle for particular portions of the cell cycle have to uh, then get degraded so they don't make proteins and inhibit the progress of the cell cycle. So, in this case, we're looking at some cell cycle regulated RNAs in, in yeast, CLIB2, SWI5. And um, the question that we had was, if these RNAs come out into the cytoplasm, how does the cell know to degrade just those RNAs and not normal RNAs that are necessary for the life of the cell, just constitutive proteins that are involved in, in cell homeostasis? Does it have to search through every single RNA and vet every single RNA? In which case, this would be a horrible thermodynamic problem for the cell to solve. And the way the cell solves it, and this graduate student, Tatiana, uh, solved this problem by showing that the degradation enzymes actually assemble with the promoter. Uh, and when the RNA is is synthesized, these enzymes are carried on the RNA out into the cytoplasm, and they sit there on the RNA, ready to chew it up at a moment's notice. And so, when a, when a cell cycle signal, such as a phosphorylation, goes through the cytoplasm, these degradation enzymes are activated, and the RNA that they're on gets immediately chewed up. So the RNA, unwittingly, is carrying the seeds of its own demise with it, uh, and then it can be, within minutes, disappear, uh, eliminated from the cytoplasm. It can disappear from the cytoplasm within a minute. So this is a very effective and rapid way of regulating cell cycle RNAs. So the cell can go on to the next stage of the cell cycle. But can you see this in real time? And this took some development to be able to see in real time this degradation occurring in yeast. And so uh, it required making a new MS2 system which degrades rapidly. So the previous MS2 system didn't degrade rapidly, and therefore it messed up the temporal uh, resolution of the system. But here we have uh, yeast going through uh, as I mentioned, ASH1 is made in anaphase, it goes to the bud tip, and then it degrades. So we're going to see that happen right here. Keep your eye on this bud, and you can see suddenly there'll be a um, flurry of activity there where the ASH1 localized, and then it's gone uh, rapidly. And on the right side here, you, just in contrast, is a uh, is an RNA which doesn't degrade uh, during the cell cycle, and the cells are... Uh, contain this RNA, and the RNA has a lifetime, but it doesn't degrade on any kind of a cue during the cell cycle. So here's some still frames, just so you can look at it uh, in more detail. Eight minutes, ten minutes in, 
there's all the localization of ASH1. And now it hangs around for a little bit, makes some protein, and then a couple minutes later, it's all gone. So this is uh, an example of how rapidly the cell can control and how precisely it can control the uh, regulation of uh, RNA lifetime when it wants to, when it wants to get rid of the RNA, when it wants to express proteins in a spike of the cell cycle and then get rid of those proteins in the RNA rapidly. So I, I just want to end by saying all this is possible by microscopy, and it was predicted by this sports hero, Yogi Berra, who said that you can observe a lot by just watching. And that's what we've done through these series of lectures, is just watch to see what RNA does, and then deduce from that what really is going on and how the cell is regulating the RNA expression from birth to death. Thank you.